Well, good morning, everybody. It's a really, ple really a pleasure for me to be here with you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Dr. Michelle Thaller, and I am a uh, an astronomer and a science educator. And um, with me today is somebody that I've had the, the immense pleasure of working with in the past, uh, Aaron Rasmussen. And um, a lot of you may, I, I, bet, I bet pretty much all of you out there are familiar with some of the projects that Aaron has been involved. I was, I was teasing him just before we went live that um, I think more than anybody else, uh, he's been, been, the, been the person this year that I get to name drop because so many people enjoy the series Masterclass. So, so Masterclass is an online uh, course series where you can take acting from Helen Mirren or, or Dustin Hoffman, or you, you can take science communication from Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and the list of celebrities, but also incredible innovators in the subjects are all ready to give you these online lessons. And, um, and then Masterclass, uh, more recently, uh, he's expanded into something uh, with the outlier.com uh, company to produce something uh, that, that involves a, a longer course series where you can actually get credit online. It's accredited by the University of Pittsburgh. And so this is one of these cases where online science education is now becoming something that you can get real college credit for. And that was one of the stranger moments of my life because um, enrollment in one of these courses was offered as a prize on the Price is Right. And so somebody you know, texted me and said, do you realize right now that your face is on the Price is Right? Because uh, I, I, did a, I did one of these courses in astronomy in conjunction with some other uh, uh, astronomers for, the, for an Astronomy 101 type class. So um, I mean, Aaron is, is an amazing innovator, an entrepreneur, and uh, uh, we, we have time for some questions for him after he gives us our talk. And then one of the things I think might be fun to expand on is uh, in, in an amazing story, and Aaron can correct this, uh, in high school, you were actually blinded by an accident in your chemistry class, temporarily blinded. And, um, and, and that gave you uh, inspiration for a very different kind of uh, sort, sort of horror adventure uh, online, online game called Blindside. And uh, the, 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 that was actually uh, nominated for many awards in the uh, the innovative game uh, uh, industry. So it, it's my pleasure to introduce Aaron Rasmussen. Um, he will present our talk, and then after that, um, I will uh, I will manage a question and answer session. So if you have questions for Aaron, uh, please put them in the chat, and uh, and I will uh, jot them down, and, and we'll get through as many as we possibly can. So with that, I Aaron, take it away. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you, NASA, for having me, and thank you, everybody, for listening. So I am Aaron Rasmussen, and I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the philosophy around beauty, attention, and STEM communication, and then get into some techniques that I've found useful. Um, I'll primarily be talking about one-to-many solutions rather than one-on-one, -on -one, although with new interactive technology, those lines are blurring to some extent. And take what you will from this. Hopefully, something will be helpful. We kind of go all over the map because uh, we've needed to communicate all sorts of different things. So first, I want to start with the question, why? This is probably my favorite question, if I had to choose favorites, although they're all very good. Um, it's a powerful question. It's one of the first one we ask as children. And you have to have a little thread to pull on when you ask the question, why? Some sort of thread that you can pull and find a solution or an answer to why, and then ask why further. And knowing how to ask why is something that can fundamentally improve your life. For example, I grew up in an interesting household. My father was a middle school science teacher, and he ran a science museum that the students created all of the exhibits for. So I ended up uh, creating a bunch of science exhibits when I was a kid. This is me actually as a six-year-old in my striped pajamas, um, putting the magnets down on my maglev for the 9,000th time. Uh, I really liked maglevs. I wanted to know why they worked and, you know, talked to my parents about it. And they said, well, you can't uh, build one with electromagnets. That would be a little too complex for you right now, but you can use permanent magnets to do it. Um, one of the horrible results to that is permanent magnets, when you're gluing them down as a six-year-old, have a habit of doing sort of magnetic dominoes and rolling themselves into a ball of magnets and, and glue, and you have to redo it a zillion times. But even as a six-year-old, I had to think about how do you communicate Science, how do you communicate how a maglev works, in my case, to other six-year-olds? I mean, I'd only been speaking English for a few years at that point. I'd only been around for a few years at that point. So as I grew, I got to sort of grow up in science museums and really think critically about what makes a good science fair project, what makes a good piece of science communication. So uh, this is actually somewhat relevant because recently my dad brought over one of my old science fair projects. This is a Van de Graaff generator that I made when I was 13 with my buddy Chris Price. 
And this is actually me about a month ago. You can kind of see a ghosted image of me on the side accidentally shocking myself in the head uh, while trying to take a photo of my hair standing up. Um, so this has clearly never left me, this curiosity and love for um, just exploring the, the whole world, you know, not just science, not just technology and, and math and engineering. So as Michelle mentioned, you probably know me from uh, Masterclass. That's probably the, the largest thing I've done. I was the creative side of that company, as well as the CTO. That's been my whole life, this sort of blend of art and science. And at Masterclass, we had to figure out how do you extract knowledge that's only available really in one place? And it's the minds of these incredible masters. And then democratize access to it. So my first company was in robotics. That's in the lower left there. It's a 20,000 pound robot that cuts granite countertops with a water jet and a diamond saw. Um, and what was interesting about that project is I just wanted to be around robots, you know, sort of take any opportunity I could. But I tried to figure out what, why does the software that runs industrial machines require an engineer to run it? Why can't just anyone run this? Why can't it be an easier communication? And it turned out the answer was there is no reason. Just nobody had done it yet. So we produced this piece of software that somebody could go from running a manual bridge saw to running a robot. And that was a really fun way to uh, partially revolutionize an industry. Now, in the lower right, you're seeing a video of uh, my second company. We actually did beverages, but we promoted the whole thing by doing hilarious uh, videos online where we build these sort of hacks and then um, you know do horrible things with them. So in this case, I'm actually explaining how an electroencephalogram can be used to track your brainwave frequency, and we hooked it up to a device that shocks people. So if you didn't remain calm, it would electrocute you. Um, that was a fun way to kind of keep my video skills sharp. And then of course, what I'm doing now is outlier.org. And outlier is, uh, as Michelle pointed out, for credit, college education. So each one of these courses is like, it, it is an introductory course in college. And it's pretty fundamentally different from what we had to figure out at Masterclass, because now we're looking at not extracting knowledge that's available only inside a master's head, but communicating knowledge that's available in many places, but communicating it well in an engaging way, in a motivating way, and hitting 200 different Bloom's taxonomy learning outcomes and making sure that somebody passes a test. So at Outlier, we have STEM classes like astronomy, statistics, and calculus, and pre-calculus, um, as well as psychology and, and sociology and some of the humanities. So let's get into a question for everyone. So the question is, if you could know all of humanity's knowledge of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics instantly, would you? I feel like this is a pretty easy yes. In fact, I'd say there's very few exceptions of people that would choose to learn this information. However, we don't, which is a little bit odd because that information's out there. So why don't we? Well, it's hard, it's lonely, we can't make it through it, we get stuck, we don't know who to ask questions of, and we have other things that are motivating us to, to do other stuff. For example, if uh, somebody offered you a million dollars to learn calculus from a textbook in three months, you'd be much more likely to do it. So that brings us to the question of what do we do in STEM communication? I believe we motivate because STEM information is out there. It's rare we're communicating something new, but the way we present it, that's where the art is. Our creativity is in the presentation, how to make it delightful. How do we get somebody to that edge of understanding? And I would say ultimately the goal of it is to start this flywheel that gets somebody capable of asking why. Creating informivores, you might say, people that want to devour information, because they'll derive a lot of delight from that if they learn to ask why on their own. So part of our job is to communicate the actual information in a serious way that's useful to people. And the other part is to inspire them to continue asking those questions and to continue learning. It's a nice picture of Michelle, who's in our astronomy course. Um, and we like to think about it this way, the, the scarcest and most valuable thing in education is one-on-one -on -one time with a teacher. And there's a lot of reasons that goes into this, but uh, Benjamin Bloom, when he did a lot of educational psychology research, found that you can get a two sigma improvement in a student's score if you give them a one-on-one -on -one tutor. And that is life-changing, right? You, you see these students go from, let's say, a C to an A minus. So 
frequently we'll, we'll see that sort of interaction, but the problem is not everybody gets a one-on-one -on -one tutor. Not everybody can have that one-on-one -on -one time. And if anybody has spent five minutes talking to Michelle, they've probably felt that desire to just like quit their job and become an astrophysicist because she's so good at making you love what's potentially out there and what else there is to learn and uncover. So the question then is, well, how do we accomplish that power of motivation, of inspiration, of tailoring content to someone's mind and where they are without having a one-on-one -on -one experience? Well, that's been around for quite a while. It's books. Now, we probably wouldn't be talking right now if books were the end-all be-all of the solution, but for many years they were. So this series on the left, A Personal Narrative, uh, I highly recommend, is written by Alexander von Humboldt. He also uh, created this beautiful poster called the Naturgemelt. I'm pronouncing that terribly, but it's uh, the original idea of the interconnectedness of nature. He also you know, discovered isotherms, things like this. What's interesting to me about Humboldt is he really captured the world with the beauty of science and the experience of naturalism. So even Charles Darwin read his works, Thoreau was reading them at Walden. And what's fascinating to me about Humboldt is he didn't start that way. He started with a pure objective science look at the field. He was only interested in the figures, the numbers, the measurements, but he became best friends with Goethe, the German poet. And Goethe taught him that you didn't have to give up objective science to see beauty in things, to have an emotional experience, to convey the emotional experience you are already having in this natural world as part of your work. And that's exactly what he did in a personal narrative. That's something that we would like to continue for, that tradition of mixing this emotional experience, this delight with the science. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of attention, because uh, this might help explain a little bit why uh, books aren't the end-all be-all at the moment. So this here is a picture of a vaudeville audience. So they're in a theater, there's actors on the stage. Um, you can imagine it would be incredibly awkward to stop paying attention in this environment. It'd be incredibly awkward to leave. Not only would you draw sort of the ire of your fellow audience members, you would be offending the people on the stage. That is a horrifying thought. That social pressure is something that's very powerful in forcing your attention. So this is a good example of forced attention. It doesn't matter if part of the play is boring, you're sitting through it. Then we move to movies. So here's a movie theater. It's similar to, let's say, a vaudeville theater, except that you're seeing moving images on the screen and they can't yell at you or scowl at you. Now, your fellow audience members might be a bit annoyed if you get up and kind of struggle your way out and then struggle your way back with your Coca-Cola and your you know, chips or whatever, um, but it's less of forced attention. You can actually sneak out and use the restroom because you don't have the people on the screen staring at you. So we moved into an interesting new environment with TV. And this is just the angriest photo that I could find of somebody with a TV remote. This is where we started to shift to earned attention from forced attention. So a TV show format, and we you know, mostly watch things probably on Netflix, et cetera, at this point. But a TV show format is actually only 22 minutes of TV in a half hour with eight minutes of ads. So there's a teaser, there's ads, act one, ads, act two, ads, act three, ads. So what that means is at the end of every act, you have to do this little dance, trying to keep your viewers' attention so they don't change the channel to something that might be more interesting or something that makes them think that they can, well, miss a little part of your show when they uh, come back and they, they didn't quite time the commercial break right. But of course, we didn't stop there. We ended up with internet video. And internet video is like the TV version on steroids. Now you can very easily switch over to a different video that's pretty interesting. You're actually getting advertised video on the right. You just click on it, you view it. This is now in competition with almost anything you're doing. And finally, we've recently seen the rise of TikTok. And TikTok is incredibly easy to move on. It is algorithmically serving up things that grab your attention. Um, this is actually my TikTok feed, and I found that if I can't grab somebody's attention in about 1.8 seconds, then I am going to lose them. And unfortunately, this is your competition today. This is what we're up against. Uh, and it is delightful. It is delightful scrolling through something that is tuned to be entertaining to you. But we're also trying to learn. 
Now, there's actually some great STEM content on TikTok as well, but as you might expect, you can only go so in depth with a, a minute to maybe three minute videos. So when we look at STEM communication and teaching, obviously I focus uh, primarily on teaching rather than, um, than sort of shorter form things. You know, the, the sort of running joke between a friend and I is I keep wanting to just make longer and longer format uh, series. So, you know, you've got master class where it's anywhere from two and a half to kind of five or six hours. And now we're at like 35 hours of video on our classes at, at Outlier. Well, when we look at the original kind of um, place that you would learn is a classroom. And that's very much like the vaudeville audience or a theater audience. It has this great forced attention in it. And that's a powerful motivator for a student to get through something that might be difficult. Many people like that feeling. Now, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we've all uh, had to switch to Zoom for a variety of courses. And that is actually, for, for my money, the easiest way to keep somebody's attention in a uh, class style environment because asynchronous video is so hard. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Zoom is sort of equivalent to watching TV with your family in the living room and like getting up to leave. There is a little bit of social pressure on it. And it's like the TV maybe being able to spot you and yell at you. So Zoom has some of that social pressure that forces attention. Now you're also earning the attention because somebody could be on a different tab, they could be on their phone, et cetera. It's a combination there. Asynchronous video, so that's, that's what I, I like to do. Uh, so this masterclass, this is outlier. You are in direct competition with TikTok at this point. So you have to try incredibly hard. You have to do the dance, dance, dance to keep somebody's attention before the commercial break, after the commercial break, et cetera. So when I think about attention, I think of attention and curiosity as a resource. It's a resource that you can build up by using emotion, by using story, awe, beauty. And that's a great thing because you can get this momentum as the viewer goes through it. It, re it reminds me a little bit of my uh, little niece, Aya. So that's her on the left and that's her twin sister, Sasha on the right, my sister, Adrian. And Aya, when she was about probably 22 months old, we're all at dinner and we're sort of a very noisy family. We're all talking about stuff. And she just starts pounding on the table and she goes, aye, 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 aye. And everybody goes silent and we all look at her and I go, Aya, you have our attention. Now, what are you going to do with it? And she just smiles at us. And I'm like, oh, she's gonna be trouble. But Aya um, wanted to just direct the attention at herself, which is a totally fine use of attention unless you're trying to teach science. In which case, you take the attention from that beauty, from that story, from that awe, and you spend it on exposition. So what do I mean by this? I used to call this at Masterclass, I used to tell people to alternate information cotton candy with your information broccoli, right? So cotton candy might be a really interesting story from a celebrity about their time in Hollywood. Okay, it's great, it's riveting. You're not necessarily learning exactly what you need to learn about writing a novel, et cetera. Now the broccoli might be how you revise a chapter. There's an important aspect to this, which is not everyone likes cotton candy and not everybody thinks that broccoli is suffering. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to, of course, you know, like any self-respecting kid in the 80s, pretend it was small trees and I was a dinosaur and I was eating all of them. It's quite a lot of fun. But this brings us to the point that you need to have a theory of mind of the student. You need to think of what we call the universal student. And this actually arose on the Christina Aguilera set. I was doing the interview and I used to ask Christina, well, tell that to the universal student. What we sort of meant by this is almost the ideal student. Stephen King refers to it as the ideal reader. We have to figure out how do we fit together information in a student's mind so it's cohesive, so they can drag from thread to thread to thread and it builds on each other. And this is an inherent difficulty in a situation like a classroom, because when you think about mathematics, everybody has a different history in math, everybody has sort of different abilities in it, different interest in it. So you might end up in a situation in a math class where some students are very fast at it and some students are very slow at it. So for the fast students, it's boring. For the students who are slower, it's excruciating because they can't keep up. But for that one student in the middle, they're doing great. Now the even bigger problem is the student that might be fast in one chapter is quite possibly gonna be slow in another chapter. This is why one-on-one -on -one teaching is really exceptional. 
because somebody can then simulate the mind of that student, understand what their knowledge base is, and teach to that knowledge base. We aren't quite able to do that in the one-to-many solution. Now, it's very helpful with asynchronous video because people can go back and rewatch it. Um, we actually do an interesting thing in calculus where we teach it three times. There's three different explanations. But what this is all driving toward is trying to give somebody what I call the grand story. And I've, I've run across this concept with a, a few people throughout my life, and I, I think people have different names for it, but I call it my grand story. What is my story of reality? Right, it's almost like when you pop up at subway stations in a new city and you kind of see parts of the city, but the whole thing doesn't fit together yet. Well, you hit a certain density of information at some point where knowledge stops being things that you are adding to that story and it starts being things that fill in voids and it is the most satisfying thing when two pieces of knowledge that are separated by this gap connect and you say oh oh and it builds on the grand story and i think a good goal of stem is to start that grand story for anyone who's watching it so they can start to add their own pieces so they can start to feel the edges of knowledge and fit them together okay Sounds great, sort of philosophically high level. Let's get down to brass tacks. I actually put this on here just because I had no idea that brass tacks could be so pretty. That was a thing I learned today. So first off, we're social animals um, and that's great. Uh, making something beautiful is making it important. So I've spent a lot of time defending why I spend so much time and effort making things beautiful. And I do love to make beautiful things. There's simply an intrinsic value to it for me. But frequently you'll find yourself in a, a situation where you do have to defend why it's worth spending an extra hour getting the lights right on something. And over the years, I have feel like I've had a better and better explanation of it. So one, when we think about we as humans, if you go on the street and you start pointing at something, Somebody will start looking at it. Then another person will look at the thing you're pointing at because somebody else is looking at it. And soon you'll have a crowd staring at who knows what. Maybe you're just pointing at a pigeon. It doesn't really matter. What matters is it is important for us as animals to know what other humans are paying attention to because it might be a tiger. It might be something, it could be food, it could be water. We are constantly aware of what other people are doing. Beauty is a way of freezing someone's in attention in an object. It's fixing something in a tangible substrate that says this was important to someone. I mean, imagine going to the tomb of King Tut. Clearly somebody important's in there who went through all of this, this misery to, to build this thing, you know? So that's part of why simply making something beautiful is a way to grab attention. So I'm gonna show about uh, 30 seconds of this clip of the Outlier Calculus trailer, and um, I just want you to pay attention mostly to the visuals. If you have a little bit of anxiety around the idea of taking calculus, I would encourage you to give it a chance. We don't all learn in the same way. So we are going to be teaching the same content in different ways. I'd say my teaching style is somewhat laid back. I'm the only instructor that's using a blackboard. And I prefer a fountain pen. And Excellent. So if you notice, there is a moment where the dust pops up from the eraser on the chalkboard. It's a really beautiful shot. What does chalk dust have to do with calculus? Absolutely nothing. What does it have to do with learning calculus though? Quite a lot. Because remember, in STEM, we're not just teaching the information, we're motivating somebody to learn the information. We're inspiring them to get through it. And you would not believe how many text messages I got from friends that said, whoa, the chalk dust, which is 100% Alan, our, our DP on that. I just said, go wild, do some beautiful stuff. And he, he came up with that. So these aren't extraneous things. These aren't the, the you know, it's not just frosting, right? This is part of the cake itself. So another way that we can get somebody's attention, and I loved this. Uh, so I was on a panel with Jackie Faraday, who's also in the astronomy course, 
the way we found her is um, some of my team went to the planetarium at the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York. And she gave the planetarium show and their minds were just blown. She's like, incredible, we have to have her in the class. So we're on this panel and you know, I asked her, hey, what's a tip you can give to teachers that are on Zoom to keep kids' attention? And she said, if you just look really excited about everything you do, people pay attention to you. And she's right, it totally works. Um, I actually, it's, I didn't use a video here, but uh, you, can, you can see her in the trailer and these sorts of things. If you look really excited, it's the same thing. We're social animals. What is this person so excited about? Now, the tricky part with that for, let's say, a uh, third grade teacher, you can't do that for seven hours a day uh, or you'll just you know, become completely exhausted. So this is definitely more appropriate for asynchronous, asynchronous or short form lectures. So here's an interesting one. And I didn't really know this was a type of learning that happened until uh, really kind of pondering what was working and, and what wasn't working about Masterclass. So this I call learning by permission. And uh, I'd shot Werner Herzog and um, it, you know, shot his class. I didn't actually shoot Werner Herzog. That did happen once. I don't know if you've ever seen this video. He, he gets shot and he just ignores it. He says it's like a minuscule bullet or something like that. Um, but we end up shooting his class and we're very proud of it. And I get this email from him and he says, hey, like, it's great, you need to come down and let's edit it together. So Joey Della Russo and I, uh, Joey being the editor, pack up our iMac, take our hard drives, show up at uh, Werner's house, set it up on his coffee table. And we sit there for seven hours, um, just working on his class. And there's this moment that we cut from White Diamond, one of his films, and it's this very dramatic moment about a, a guy talking about another man dying and he says, you know, he, he hit the ground and then we, we cut. It's a very dramatic piece of the class. We liked that, we liked the drama in it. And Werner says, no, no, hold, 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 hold. And we held the shot and we held the shot, we held the shot. We didn't cut after the guy says the dramatic thing. He's just standing there, standing there looking around. And what we found is if you hold, if you hold for that long, you start to focus on the man's feelings about this. You stop focusing on the story of the other man dying, but you see the effect of it on the person who witnessed it. And we wouldn't have seen that if we went by our usual instincts. And what required us, or what was required for us to be able to do that was by an authority figure, Werner, giving us permission to override our instincts, giving us permission to do something. This is the fastest way to learn. Another example I remember reading on writing by Stephen King, he said, dialogue tags, don't worry about he retorted, she asked, et cetera, et cetera. Just say he said and she said. People's brains skip over it anyways. That's so much easier. That's something you already wanna do in writing. You don't wanna think of a new crazy dialogue tag each time. You want permission from an authority figure to do the thing you're already doing. So the way this relates to STEM is frequently with difficulty. Hannah Fry points out, uh, when anybody looks at a page of, of maths, uh, they sometimes get that like weird sick feeling like you're never gonna get through it. She said, the funny thing is mathematicians get that too. The difference is a mathematician knows that if you sit there for long enough, you work on it for long enough, it will make sense to you. And that, that teaching by permission is so helpful because it makes it feel like you're not alone in this that the professionals also have the same feelings. So let's do a couple examples here. So um, we'll just play this clip here. And, and Jamie, if you could just give me a heads up when it's done, but I'll, I'll just preface this briefly and then we'll, we'll hit play. So uh, this is Wired's Five Levels created by uh, my dear friend, Joe Sabia. And this is the first one they did. And the concept is let's have a scientist explain something about their field to a child, to a teen, to a grad student, to another professional in five levels. So you get to see these deeper and deeper cuts on a topic. What a great concept to learn more about science. So let's go ahead and watch this adorable clip. Do you know why we're here today? Because we're talking about science. Yes, we're gonna talk about science and we're gonna talk about a very specific kind of science about people who study brains. Do you know what a brain is? What is it? Um, something that helps 
help you remember things. Definitely. So what we're going to talk about, this is something that people study in the brain called the connectome. Oh. Do you know that your body is made up of really tiny things called cells? Um, yes, I know that. Okay. Well, there's more cells in your brain, like way more cells than, than all the stars we can see. <laughs> And so what the connectome is, is we'd like to know where every cell in your brain is and how it talks to every other cell in your brain. That was awesome, Daniel. Thank you. Excellent. So that is adorable. That just blew that kid's mind. So the question is, would it be quicker to just read this information? Yeah, absolutely. But would it be as delightful? No. And as you can see, these are like 16 to 20 minute videos talking about pretty in-depth scientific concepts because of this methodology. Because we get to be delighted by seeing somebody else learn about it. So here's, whoop. Do you know why we're here today? Now my presentation is fighting me for a second. Okay, so here's another one, and, and Jamie, you can just roll that one. Um, so this is a clip that I absolutely love. I think it's the very definition of beauty in STEM. So this is by Melody Sheep. It is a time lapse of the future, and it basically goes to the end of time, and, and in many ways past the end of time. What happens when entropy becomes infinity? And I've actually time lapsed the time lapse, so this is just out of control, trillions of years flying by. But all I want you to do is get a sense of the extraordinary beauty in these clips. I mean, it really is absolutely stunning. If you can do this, and this takes extraordinary talent, it is one of the best ways to communicate anything. I watched a couple of friends start watching this and they were being kind of critical initially, and then they just became just frozen and in rapt attention and watched the entire 30 minutes of it. And I think that this, in many ways, is something that I aspire to, and I think that many should aspire to, because at the end of it, you have a really good sense of what does science currently think about the future, because we don't know. And that's even one of the more exciting things. It gives you all these little threads to ask why, what is that, what's that over there, and why are these things called strings, etc. So I'll just move on past it. Finally, I want to show a clip from our astronomy course. And for this one, uh, it's actually been cut down so it's a little quicker for TikTok, but I think that um, I would like you to pay attention specific specifically to uh, Hakeem Alushe's performance. All of the planets orbit the sun in the same plane. And what this means is that when you look at the night sky, planets, the sun, and the moon all move on this one line. We modern astronomers call this the plane of the ecliptic. And what the ancient people did is they noticed that as these planets moved along this line, there were certain constellations along that line that the planets would move through. And those constellations became the constellations of the zodiac. Many people think that the constellations of the zodiac are the brightest constellation, but that's not true at all. Take for example, my constellation Pisces. It's not very bright, but some are absolutely spectacular. And one of my favorites is Scorpio. Scorpio wraps its tail around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So if you're ever in the Southern Hemisphere where the center of the Milky Way is directly overhead, you are in for okay, a treat. So Hakeem does a great job presenting the camera there. And what's interesting is this was all shot in quarantine. He is alone in that room. Um, we had to, you know, set up cinematography equipment. He helped do it. Uh, he's doing a fantastic job. You notice there's a lot of hand motion, which is really helpful. He's also uh, subverting this concept that we have that maybe the Zodiac are made of the brightest stars. Now, I actually didn't know this till our astronomy class. This was a knowledge gap for me. I didn't know that it was the planets moving through the ecliptic. So this was a delightful thing for me to learn. Also, never be embarrassed about knowledge gaps. We've all got tons of them, um, but gosh, it feels great to fill those in. All of the so visual performance. There are many different ways to show beauty. One of my favorite ways is through words. 
And there's this passage from Cosmos, the surface of the earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. On this shore, we've learned most of what we know. Recently, we've waded a little way out, maybe ankle deep, and the water seems inviting. That isn't beautiful what is. And this is an example of, this is King Tut's tomb. Somebody spent time on this. This is important. And it draws you in through the rest of the narrative. But these aren't the only ways that something can be beautiful and grab your attention. For example, you can have the interaction, like the five-year-old and the neuroscientist. You can have sound. Uh, if you watch Melody Sheep, you'll actually see some or hear some really great sound design. You have visuals. You have the emotion, right? And you have silence, which I have a certain respect for, actually, after Usher's masterclass. He, uh, he was big on, hey, don't be afraid of silence. It draws attention to you very quickly. OK, so we have all of these tools. How do we choose? In many ways, as STEM communicators, we are editing from the infinite ways that we can communicate something into the scenes, the moments, the minutes that we want to show to a student or to a viewer. I would say always choose performance over beauty. A cell phone camera capturing an extraordinary performance is so much better than the best cinema camera and the most beautiful set design. However, beautiful set designs plus an amazing performance is something incredible. It can be distracting to capture something poorly. The, the way I liken it is to having a class in like a, a middle school classroom where there's like a banging air conditioner and like the windows open, it's too cold for some reason and like you have a squeaky desk. There's a lot of distractions. But if you're in this beautiful hardwood lecture hall, again, King Tut's tomb, it's important, it's special and it's comfortable. You know, if you're not straining to see through the, the graininess of the cell phone capture, you're going to potentially learn a bit more. But performance and beauty aren't the only aspects. And I think a lot as an editor, uh, my first, well, I had a few real jobs, picking strawberries, this sort of thing. But uh, my first sort of job that wasn't uh, agricultural was as a video editor. So I think about film as an editor frequently. And one of my favorite uh, thinkers on editing is Walter Murch. He wrote in the blink of an eye. And this is as pertinent to film editing as it is to any editing, any presentation to somebody, any of that sort of the medium of captured thought as he thinks of it. You know, it's almost when you see video, you're looking through somebody's eyes and cuts or blinks and it moves to a new location. So he has this thing called the rule of six. And I've, I've thought about this for years. I really don't have a better set of priorities than this. I think it's fantastic. So the idea is if you've got two uh, cuts, two clips, right? That's what you're trying to decide, which clip to cut to which clip. What do you prioritize? And he says, number one, emotion, which is interesting. You'll hear frequently, serve the story, serve the story. Number one, emotion. Now that could be an emotional match between the clips. It could be a contrast that you want, but serve the emotion first. Only then do you serve the story. Then rhythm. Then eye trace, which is kind of an interesting thing. This is uh, frequently when you're in a theater, your eye has to travel between parts of this giant silver screen. So when you cut between clips, if the area of focus is pretty far out, you, your eye might have to move too much. And unless you're intentionally doing that, it can be a little bit distracting. Then you have the 2D plane of the screen and the 3D space. Think almost of that as just kind of um, blocking. You know, there's pretty frequently you'll cut and somebody's actually walking at a 90 degree angle from where they were in the last shot. And uh, you don't even notice because if the emotion is there, that's what you're focused on. So when you think about what you have to choose, Choose emotion first, then story. Choose performance over beauty. But if you can, get it all. Um, the other thing I, I highly recommend when we think about teaching somebody to ask the question why, I've mentioned leaving a thread, leaving a clue. It's so important, otherwise you feel sort of disconnected and you don't know where to start with something. So I ran into this actually uh, in researching for this talk. So I was on the NASA heliophysics page. Um, I'm actually on this page a lot, like my background's been the same, you know, hydrogen alpha picture of the sun for a while. I don't know, I just love it. I think y'all produce some really gorgeous images. And I was uh, looking for some good pictures for the presentation and I'm looking at the page and there's something in the background, right? There's like this kind of blue with stars and I don't know, some sort of strange astrological body out there, astronomical uh, body. and. One thing that I picked up on doing because I was born before the internet 
is I like looking at people's background images on websites because it's something that's usually kind of personal to them. So I download the background image and it's something extraordinary. I was just looking at the corner of it. What is this thing? So now, okay, now the why, what, why this, what is going on? Um, I mean, I recognize that we've got sort of a Corona picture and we got a few different wavelengths going on here. And I go back to the NASA webpage and whoever put this button here is a hero. That button literally takes you to a blog about the background image you can barely see. So that was Comet uh, Ison, and it says it's coming in from the bottom right, moving out toward the upper right and getting fainter and fainter. And it's a time-lapse image. And here's what's interesting. They, they know the comet shrank in size, but they're not really sure what comes out the other side. So the question remains as to whether the bright spot seen moving away from the sun was simply debris, or whether it was a small nucleus of the original ball of ice was still there. Regardless, as likely is now only dust. Karen C. Fox, whoever you are, thank you for writing that. This is my ideal situation. If you noticed, earlier on in my presentation, I uh, asked the question, would you like to learn everything in science and mathematics? And it was on this background of this very sci-fi looking thing. Well, that's an actual real uh, ion thruster. It's called a Hall Effect thruster. It's a six kilowatt xenon one. Um, I actually put that down in the lower right, just in case somebody saw that and said, whoa, is that a real thing? Speaking of real, I recommend making things real and not talking down. And it, you can talk down to somebody and have it not be condescending. You can be really, really trying to help them. I would say this is, um, if I had a controversial opinion in this, this would be where it is. And um, I think I got a lot of value when I was a kid out of getting to use the tools that adults get to use. I just wanted a real drill when I was six years old. I didn't want a Fisher Price drill, I wanted a real drill. So for my birthday, I got a Black & Decker. And in that maglev uh, picture, I actually had gotten to drill all of those side rails in and I was thrilled. I got to be like an adult. I also learned to program when I was very young. And back then we didn't have really programming languages that were sort of built for kids. So you just learn basic. And it was hard, but it was awesome. It was getting a tiny finite piece of the real thing. So actually when we started making calculus, I called NASA because I said, hey, wouldn't it be amazing if our students plotted the Mars 2020 mission trajectory of the space probe? Um, and then like that's kind of the reveal at the end. So. Uh, NASA was very helpful, kind of passed me to various experts. And it turns out that with single variable calculus, you have to simplify a trajectory so much, it's not really useful. It's not really the real thing. And I would say it's worth not doing that because it, it makes you feel somehow distant from the sort of bare metal of reality. Because the nice thing about oh, I'm on 39. Excellent, thank you. Um, so adult tools are always amazing for kids, but not just kids. I remember in college, I took a linear algebra class and we were learning matrix math. And one of our uh, kind of questions that we had to do was solving the space shuttle's attitude control system. You got sensor data coming in, you've got attitude correction coming out the other side, but it was the actual attitude control system. It's a very, very tiny part, a very, very tiny part, but it was the whole thing. And something clicked for me in that moment where I realized, oh my gosh, I can, I can make anything. I can make anything if I cut it down to small enough pieces. And if I could give that feeling to someone that they could make anything, oh my gosh, that would be extraordinary. Quickly, stay humble. This is commercial art. What we do is modulated by the audience. I have my personal art. I do a bunch of weird stuff on the side. Um, I don't care what other people think of it. It's just for me, but that's my personal life. When communicating, it is all about the audience. So sometimes you'll make a beautiful image. Sometimes you'll write a lovely line. Don't fall in love with it. Or if you do, prepare to get your heart broken. As they say in screenwriting, kill your darlings. Uh, it's hard to do. I've actually done a ton of them on this talk. Um, I know we're, we're coming up on time pretty shortly uh, regardless, but um, there was a, a, a veritable darling massacre in this talk. And, you know, we'll see what the audience thinks of it. 
I'll potentially do this talk some other time and I will have modified it. So a couple last stories. So one is to trust your intuition. It may not be pure madness. We're good as, as a communicator. You think about the way people listen, the way you listen. You start to really get to the fine level of detail of that 51% of you believe something and 49% believe something else. There may be some truth in that. So a little story about shooting Aaron Sorkin. Again, shooting Aaron Sorkin's masterclass, not shooting Aaron Sorkin, who as far as I know, hasn't been shot on like Warner Herzog. So this was the first day of filming. Um, I love Aaron's work. And, um, you know, overall, just kind of nervous about filming the whole thing. And Ava Burkowski was my DP on this. And we set up this beautiful set, actually took us two and a half days to pick out that wallpaper. I'd like everybody to appreciate the color of the blue on that wallpaper. It's a good color. Um, it's not the Florida Lee that I wanted, but it's little grapes. So that's that's fine. So we're about, you know, uh, early in the morning. We set up the set. It looks really good. And uh, about two and a half hours out from the from Aaron arriving, Ava says, hey, we can't get one of the, the lights high enough to really get the angle that I like on it. Uh, is it cool if we like rotate the set? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So I wander away. I'm going over my questions and all sort of the pre-production that I do. And I come back and it's now an hour and a half before Aaron gets there. And the set's been reflected, not, not rotated, but reflected. So and I'll explain why this is important. So this is a setup, there's a, a, a different set, but that's, that's actually me sitting there. And you'll see there's two cameras. One, he's looking at me through a periscope, and the other is to my right, it's on a slider. So it shoots into the left side of his face. For some reason, that's really important to me. So when she reflected the set, the slider ended up on the left, shooting in the right side of his face. So I got that like weird, horrible feeling. And I go to my my producers and I, I said, hey, um, how crazy am I being on a, slot, a scale of one to 10 if I asked to have the whole site or the whole set pulled apart, reflected and put back together so I could shoot it into the left side of his face? And they're like, oh, one to 10. And by the way, this is a game we play. This is a good game to play with your team. Uh, they were like, yeah, that's probably about an eight out of 10. And I go, great, because we're doing everything under a nine today. So I go back and sure enough, they, they scramble, they flip the set. She makes this beautiful image and I love it. I'm so much more comfortable with it. There's something about it I like and I, I couldn't quite figure out why. Well, one of my, at the time, a junior producer, which has risen through the ranks, my friend Jasmine Sadu said about four weeks later, she said, you know, you said that thing about shooting the left side of my, uh, a left side of somebody's face. And it made me ask why that would be. So I did some Googling and it turns out the left side of your face is more expressive than the right side of your face. So this is actually from the late seventies. And the theory here is that because your, your hemispheres are cross-linked, your left hemiface is controlled by your right hemisphere. So you actually express emotion more intensely. Now I've found subsequent studies where people actually frequently find the left side of your face more attractive. Now some recent studies say that actually it's, it's emotions of disgust and things that come out more intensely to the left. So there was some method to this madness and I didn't know it at the time, but to this day, uh, I mean, as you've probably seen in the, the outlier courses, I continue to just like to shoot in the left side of the face. Okay, final story, back to the question why. Clifford Stoll uh, was a grad student who caught a bunch of hackers in the 80s and he wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg. I read this book when I was like 10 or 11. It had a big impact on me, especially the scene where he's defending his, his dissertation. And he talks with the, uh, the panel for about an hour. And uh, the lead guy says, I've got just one question, Cliff. And he's carving his way through this, this pencil. It's a very 80s scene. He says, why is the sky blue? And he says, you know, his mind goes profoundly blank. He has no idea. So he just sort of stumbles out, uh, scattered light. Yeah, scattered sunlight. So the guy says, could you be more specific? And Cliff says, well, okay, words came from somewhere. And he starts babbling about the spectrum of sunlight and the upper atmosphere and how light interacts with molecules of air. Could you be more specific? So now he's describing how air molecules have dipole moments, the wave particle duality of light, scribbling equations on the blackboard. And could you be more specific? So an hour of explanation 
And this five-year-old's question has drawn together oscillator theory, electricity, magnetism, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics. And he said even in his miserable writhing, he admired the guy. So what I would suggest is be the five-year-old when others can and teach them to be the five-year-old when they can. Because everybody will get a lot out of that. It's not enough just to show people awe. It's not enough to just show them something beautiful and have them be floored by it and forget about it. Maybe look for the next thing. That's sort of the giving somebody a fish style. Instead, teach them how to fish for awe. And remember that they bait their lines with the question, why? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I apologize for the, the sun. I'm trying to get the sun. So if you have questions for Aaron, uh, please put them in the chat and, and I will try to uh, to moderate that. And uh, and then we have uh, a couple minutes for uh, for some questions and answers. So um, I guess I was starting out, Aaron. I mean, one of the things you said is is I, I hadn't realized it was a, it was a screenwriter thing, but the idea of, you know, you, you have to sacrifice your darlings. And um, this is something that I, you know, that I've really tried to uh, do when I advise scientists on giving a talk is I, I actually, the way I, I, I put it is I go through a lot of mourning. I put everything in the talk that I want to actually have in the talk. And then I take out all those things I'm not going to have time to do. And, and, and you have to mourn that. You have to go through the mourning period of not being able to say everything you want. So that, that idea of narrative, uh, you know, I think that, 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 that that's something that really resonated with me a lot. So um, one of the things that we were talking about uh, just to kind of get some of the conversation going is um you know this idea you you, you, you talked we, we talked a bit before about the video game you made called blindside and you said that there's been some development there as well that you know, this may be a very different type of movie that's coming out or, or going to be produced or uh, so tell us a bit about that yeah yeah blindside's a funny one because um so uh, i have a strange story in my background i was in chemistry i was actually going to go into chemistry before this happened and was in a horrible explosion, potassium nitrate and red, uh, uh, red phosphorus, um, burned my whole face and a lot of my head and I was blind. So I spent a little time blind and um, it was very traumatic so I couldn't return to a lab for many years. But after I sort of got over that, my friend Michael Astolfi and I wrote this video game together and we wanted to convey the experience of being blind. Um, by the way, this is a whole part of the talk that ended up on the darling pile, uh, Michelle, because I was talking, I, I wanted to do a bit about how much do you use simulation and how much do you use reality? Because in the game, we had to simulate being blind. But if you haven't been blind before, it's a little bit subtle. So you have to crank up the effect of, of sort of the spatial feeling around you. In any case, um, we made this video game uh, about 10 years ago and we got an email um, about a year and a half ago and Radar Pictures said, hey, we love this idea. We'd love to make it into a movie. And um, it just came out in the Hollywood Reporter. The Soska sisters are writing and directing a movie called Unseen. And it is based on the Blindside video game. And I uh, can't say too much about it, but let's just say that they have very innovative ideas about how to do a video game or a, a movie that comes from a video game that has no visuals at all. Thank you. All right, so I noticed we have a question from Carl. Um, I'm, uh, so Carl asked, was that mana potions? <laughs> God, yes, it was. It was. So my, my second company was uh, a beverage company. And um, we our first product was Mana Potion. And it was, it, I have a new rule. No more joke companies. Like, I had so much fun doing that. It was like with one of my good friends, Eli. We caused all sorts of trouble. We ultimately ended up selling the company. But, it, it you know, we ran it for like four and a half years or something. Um, but it was a total lark. And then we made all sorts of other strange things like a drink called blood. And that's a whole other story. <laughs> okay, we got a question from Jessica. Uh, so uh, let's see. Jessica asked, thank you so much for this inspiring and informative talk. What are some methods or techniques you use to seek and portray beauty or emotion when you only have a short time with an audience? That's a tough one. Um, so I would say, so I think about this a lot. So, you know, the question of if you have a short time, how do you portray beauty and emotion? Uh, for me, that's in trailers. I love trailers. Um, loved making them at Masterclass, learned under really fantastic people, love making them at Outlier. You've got about a minute and a half, and you've got to convey beauty and emotion. I highly recommend watching the entire Calculus trailer. I'd also watch the Pre-Calc trailer, actually pretty much, pretty much any of them at Outlier. I go for contrast, right? So 
I like to have a build up and then a drop. You know, happiness, energy, and then silence. And that contrast over short periods of time will make the beauty and the emotion feel so much more heightened. The second thing to remember, and this is kind of a, a, a film thing, music is great for emotion. Dialogue is great for exposition. Choose your music well. Uh, people have bled over that. People have made those things beautiful. They've been important to them. And they can tell a story with a music and emotion like you wouldn't believe. I mean, listen to Max Richter, for example. You're just in it. Five seconds into Vladimir's Blues and you're, you're there. Yeah, the, the use, use of silence again, that, that's something that I've noticed is very effective in, in speaking. You know, to, to really focus attention on you and bring your audience all together. It's, it's, it's a use of real drama. And people think that they need to fill every single second with something, but that silence really draws people in. I um, love it. There's, I, I was going to say there's a great example, which is there's a Super Bowl commercial. And uh, it's terrible that I can't remember for what car company. That's probably a bad sign. But it was just totally silent, black and white car going through the desert. In the Super Bowl, there's so much going on, and it was just dead silence and it just instant focus. A very interesting and long question from Molly. Let me, let me read this thing. Uh, so, so Molly asks, I used to produce an online course for edX. Uh, the completion rates were very low, and a large majority of the audience was already highly educated. I'd hoped that online learning would democratize education, but instead it seemed to widen the divide. I'm wondering if you could tell us about your audience. Who do you reach and who do you want to reach? And what methods are used to reach those audiences? Great question. Great question. Um, because this is this is something that we found when putting together Outlier. You know, can this work? That's what a lot of people ask. Can you have democratized access to education and have people actually complete it? Well, uh, that's, I mean, you, you got a lot in this talk of sort of the way we think about beauty in it, but we actually do a lot of educational psychology uh, on our side. So we went out to the best educational psychologists and said, how do you get people to actually learn online? And the punchline to all of this is at Outlier, our completion and completion with credit rates are basically even and sometimes uh, exceeding in-person classes. And that has never happened before. Usually you hear completion rates around 6%, 2%. Now, as far as our audience goes, um, we have everyone from you know frequently traditional college students who are trying to save money, et cetera, to continuing education students that are going back, getting post back, um, and preparing for master's degree. Some people who are just sort of lifelong learners um, who you might have seen be successful in on other platforms where they can kind of force themselves through. And we have people all the way down to, to very talented 13 year olds and a lot of high school students that make it through our classes with no problem. I wish I could point at a single methodology that makes that happen. I mean, we use guesswork and active learning. Um, we're very competency based. We believe on um, Michelle, I'm just seeing your cat there. We believe in uh, the Benjamin Bloom, um, you know, mastery learning style. But the best description I've had for why this works when it hasn't worked before is if I and I, I don't know anything about uh, Molly, but in the early 2000s, there was a these tablet PCs. And if people remember them, they were like terrible. It was basically just a PC with a stylus and it was this super thick tablet and they get like insanely hot and just kind of melt through your leg. Um, and people were like, well, tablet PCs don't work. We're all excited about it. Tablet PCs don't work. You can think of that as the low completion rate online education. Well, it took 10 years later and the iPad comes out. The iPad, everybody's like, this is amazing. This is a revolution. Tablet PCs of the future. Well, what's different about the iPad? It had a touch screen. Cool. There were actually some of those ones back in the early 2000s that had a touch screen. It was a combination of the touch screen, the interface, the ease of use, that ability to draw you through it. It was so many small things that added to a fundamentally different experience. And I wish that I had a, a, a magic bullet that I could tell you that we use, but it really is a bunch of, of small things put together, including getting our students together. You know, we're cohort based, we're, we're you know, really hope that people learn together in our social. Uh, we think about fitness frequently. Um, I don't like going to the gym. I think it's terrible. Um, I won't go on my own, but if a friend goes with me, I'm totally happy to. The same miserable thing. Well, I happen to really like calculus. Other people don't. So for them, it's like going to the gym. If they can go with a friend, they'll get through calculus fine.
Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, we, we have one last question and we need to wrap up. So uh, Michelle asks, uh, what do you think NASA does well and what do we need to work on? And thank you for your talk. That was uh, another comment. That's Oh, thank you. Um, so NASA does an extraordinary number of things well. Uh, heliophysics really is up there with my just absolute favorite. The creativity in the photographs you do is extraordinary. There's some like long exposures from the ISS. Like I seriously, this my talk would probably be more polished today if it weren't for the heliophysics uh, image gallery. One thing that I love is Michelle, uh, her explanation of basically the heavy metals in our bloodstream and in our hearts uh, coming from the, the hearts of dead stars. Um, and I actually wanted to get into this a little bit further, but, but you can find this online. That is an example of something that sticks with people. I've had people mention that over and over again. So you have people like Michelle, which is extraordinary. You know, hang on to them, get them out there. Um, what you need to work on, I would say, is, is putting the whole thing together. It's pretty fractured right now. You have a lot of great kind of islands of beautiful content and interesting STEM communication, but I don't know really where to go to just like, show me some NASA space stuff. And I just see like the best NASA space stuff. Now that might exist, but as a consumer and as somebody who's motivated to see more of this, um, I don't know where to go with that. So that that's what I would recommend. You have the most awe-inspiring images that I think our species knows. <laughs> um, you get it out there. Well, thank you, Aaron. Uh, one, one thing I'll note is that the chat is absolutely full of thank yous and thank you for this incredible talk and we've learned so much. So we're going to have to wrap it up, but uh, you, you definitely made an impression on all of us. And I hope this won't be the last time that we have a chance to talk to you about, about some of the things that we're doing and maybe even seek your advice on things. But thank you so much for joining us today. Anytime, and thank you so much for having me, and, and thank you everyone for listening. All right. Include, uh, this, uh, uh, this particular uh, presentation, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, hope to see you all here again sometime. Thank you again, Aaron.